Today's episode is sponsored by Real Estate for Life. The Wounded Knee Massacre, also known as the Battle of Wounded Knee, was part of what the U.S. military called the Pine Ridge Campaign and occurred on December 29, 1890, and it was the deadliest mass shooting in U.S. history. Historian Jeffrey Osler wrote in 2004, Wounded Knee was not made up of a series of discrete, unconnected events. Instead, from the disarming of the burial of the dead, it consisted of a series of acts held together by an underlying logic of racist domination. The end result was around 300 Lakota Sioux, half being women and children, murdered by soldiers of the United States Army. But why? What led to the massacre of the Lakota Sioux? How did the U.S. Army justify the action? What really happened? What was the initial cover story? Hello, I'm Colin Heaton, military veteran, historian, author, and welcome to this episode of Forgotten History. For decades, the U.S. government had continued to seize Native American lands, and the Sioux were a special target, especially the Lakota, after gold was discovered in the Black Hills of South Dakota. The government engaged in several treaties, mainly to address Sioux concerns. A critical issue was the reality that bison herds of the Great Plains, critical to the Plains Indians, had been hunted to near extinction. The government ensured the Lakota, in particular, that their reservations' lands would be protected from encroachment by settlers and gold miners. But these promises were not kept. There was understandable disquiet among the Sioux placed on the reservations. The Sioux, who had been resistant to being subjugated by the U.S. government and simply wanted to live their lives in peace, but the government had concerns about a new ritual that they deemed dangerous to the peaceful control of the tribes. During this time, news spread among the reservations of a Paiute prophet named Wavoka, founder of the Ghost Dance religion. He had a vision that the Christian Messiah, Jesus Christ, had returned to Earth in the form of a Native American. This was called the Ghost Dance Movement, a ceremony meant to serve several purposes. The extermination of the buffalo herds and the taking of arable land forced the Sioux and other nations to depend upon the U.S. government for food and basic survival. The results were less than exemplary, and many government-appointed Indian agents stole food or sold it to the tribes at high prices or in trade goods, or sometimes they just withheld the food, creating starvation conditions. To the Sioux, the ghost dance celebration brought them hope that the white man would soon disappear, the buffalo herds would return, people would be reunited with loved ones who had since passed away, the old way of living before the white man would return. Some tribes, including the Sioux, believed that a great earthquake and flood would occur, which would drown all the whites. Part of the prophecy included the return of dead ancestors, bringing peace and prosperity to all. It was believed that the prophecy would come true by performing the ceremony which was conducted by a slow and solemn ghost dance, performed as a shuffle in silence to a slow, single drumbeat. Sitting Bull had himself expressed doubts about the ceremony and the magic involved, or that the dead would be brought back to life, but he had no objections to allowing his people to dance the ghost dance. The Lakota emissaries who visited Wavoka, Kicking Bear and Short Bull, were taught that while performing the ghost dance, they would wear special ghost dance shirts, as had been seen by Black Elk in a vision. Apparently, Kicking Bear understood, rather, he misunderstood the meaning of the shirts, and he spread the word that they would be able to stop the white man's bullets. This movement had been labeled religious and spiritual in nature, pagan, but it was considered dangerous by the settlers and the government, and white settlers called it the coming of the Messiah War, and they were very concerned that the ghost dance ceremony signified a potentially dangerous Sioux resurgence. If you are moving to a warmer state or just a family-friendly region, contact Real Estate for Life to work with one of their 
1,400 conscientious, experienced agents in the U.S. or Canada. Go to realestateforlife.org and don't forget to mention you heard it on Forgotten History. Also, from Real Estate for Life's one-stop shop, you'll find principled vendors for financial and real estate planning, new mortgages and refinancing, Christ-centered health care and more. So visit realestateforlife.org today. The frontier settlers were alarmed by the sight of the many Great Basin and Plains tribes performing the ghost dance, worried that it might be a prelude to armed attack. The U.S. government was increasingly concerned about the spiritual movement's influence at Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. The basic information they were indoctrinated with was that they had been defeated and placed on reservations because they had angered the gods by abandoning their traditional customs. The ghost dance ceremony would supposedly remedy all of these issues. The ghost dance ritual was officially banned on the Lakota reservations, but the practice continued anyway. Due to the rising tensions, many of Sitting Bull's tribe left to join Chief Bigfoot's tribe, and wanting to avoid further violence, Bigfoot led his people and the newcomers further south toward the reservation at Pine Ridge, South Dakota. One plan that was discussed by the government was to bring William F. Buffalo Bill Cody into the negotiations. He had known Sitting Bull and other chiefs for many years, and they had his trust. But Cody and his Wild West show were touring Europe at the time, and he was unavailable. Tensions only increased as the harsh winter set in, and the Lakota were starving and not allowed to go hunt for food. James McLaughlin, the U.S. Indian agent at the Standing Rock Agency where Chief Sitting Bull lived, was also very concerned. Being heavily outnumbered by Lakota, he ordered several of the chiefs taken into custody to be held as hostages, including Sitting Bull, and he hoped that these influential leaders could persuade their people to abandon their messiah craze. The report stated, On December 15, 1890, 40 Native American policemen arrived at Sitting Bull's house to arrest him, but he refused to comply. The police resorted to using force, enraging the Lakota members. One Lakota, Catch the Bear, fired his rifle and shot Lieutenant Bullhead, who then fired his revolver hitting Sitting Bull in the chest, and tribal police officer Red Tomahawk shot Sitting Bull in the head. Sitting Bull died between 12 and 1 p.m., and afterward over 200 members of his Hunkpapa band escaped from Standing Rock to join Chief Spotted Elk, later known as Bigfoot, and his Minikanju band at the Cheyenne River Indian Reservation. What later came out was that Sitting Bull agreed to come with the police and asked that his horse be saddled while he dressed. Meanwhile, a large group of ghost dancers gathered outside the cabin, and when Sitting Bull and the police stepped outside, one of the dancers shot Lieutenant Henry Bullhead. Bullhead pulled his gun and shot back at the dancer, but accidentally shot Sitting Bull instead. Another policeman, Red Tomahawk, then killed Sitting Bull with a shot to the head. Six police and seven Lakota were killed in the exchange of gunfire. The two reports are similar, but there are some differences. Following this event, Spotted Elk and his band, along with 38 Hunkpapa, then left the Cheyenne River Reservation on December 23rd to join Red Cloud at the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. In response to what was perceived as a growing rebellion, the orders were then issued to the Army to control the Sioux and stop their independence movement as well as disarm them. All the chiefs were named in the arrest orders. Bigfoot himself was unaware that there was an arrest warrant for him, and being old and suffering from pneumonia, he had no intentions of fighting and carried a white flag which they planted as his people set up camp. On December 28, 1890, Major Samuel M. Whiteside led a detachment of the U.S. 7th Cavalry and met with Spotted Elk's band of Minikanju Lakota and 38 Hunkpapa Lakota near Porcupine Butte on the Lakota Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota and escorted them five miles to the west, camping near Wounded Knee Creek. John Shangru, a scout and interpreter who was half Lakota, advised Whiteside, do not disarm the Lakota immediately as it would lead to violence. 
The rest of the 7th Cavalry Regiment, commanded by Colonel James W. Forsyth, arrived the next morning, on December 29th, bringing the numbers of soldiers to 500, and they surrounded the encampment, where there were 230 Lakota men and 120 women and children. Forsyth also brought four M1875 Hotchkiss mountain guns covering the troopers, who were to disarm the Sioux. Forsyth then ordered the Lakota to surrender all weapons, and the immediate removal of the Lakota from the zone of military operations to awaiting trains. The soldiers searched and confiscated 38 rifles, not including those taken from the Lakota. None of the old men or women were armed, but a medicine man named Yellowbird allegedly harangued the young men, who were becoming agitated by the search and the tension spread to the soldiers. As the story goes, a deaf tribesman named Black Coyote, who did not speak English, was either reluctant to give up his rifle or did not understand the command, and he apparently resisted, claiming he had paid a lot for it. Then, during this event, Yellowbird began performing the ghost dance, and he told the men that their ghost shirts were bulletproof. During the process, one of the Indian scouts told the soldiers, Black Coyote is deaf, and when the soldier persisted, he said, stop, he cannot hear your words. At that moment, two soldiers seized Black Coyote from behind, and in the struggle, his rifle fired. Then, according to the army, Yellowbird then threw some dust in the air, and approximately five young Lakota men with concealed weapons threw aside their blankets and fired their rifles at Troop K of the 7th. After this initial exchange, the firing became indiscriminate. After Black Coyote's rifle went off, the soldiers, being already anxious, started shooting, most who had already been disarmed, killing most, including Black Coyote. What occurred next was as confusing as anything could get. The shooting by the soldiers was at close range, and all were in the open, and most of the Sioux men were killed or wounded without having a chance to return fire. Some of the Sioux ran to take back their confiscated rifles and started firing back on the soldiers. Bigfoot was among the first killed, and his corpse lay in the snow for three days before being tossed into a mass grave. During the brief initial firefight, the soldiers manning the Hotchkiss guns fired into the camp where the women and children were hiding. It would appear that many of the soldiers killed and wounded were hit by friendly fire from the Hotchkiss guns. The surviving women and children ran from the killing zone to seek protection in a nearby ravine, jumping into the ditch. Then military discipline among the soldiers disintegrated. Officers could not control their men as they chased down the survivors on horseback over several miles and killed them. Then some soldiers went around killing the wounded laying on the ground. The entire event lasted less than an hour and the estimates on the killed and wounded vary widely from at least 150 Lakota killed and 50 wounded to nearly 300 having been killed or wounded. Then a snowstorm arrived, becoming a blizzard that prevented an immediate search for dead, wounded, or survivors who fled. Reports indicate that the soldiers loaded 51 survivors, four men and 47 women and children onto wagons and took them to the Pine Ridge Reservation. Army casualties numbered 25 dead. In fact, 25 soldiers had died at the scene and 39 were wounded, with six of the men dying later of their wounds. The soldiers managed to find the bodies of the women and children up to three miles from camp. On January 1st, 1891, after the three-day blizzard had passed, the soldiers dug a mass grave, filled it with the bodies they had recovered. Civilians were also hired to help. Some of the dead Sioux's relatives had already recovered some of them. Four infants were found still alive, wrapped in their deceased mother's shawls. The numbers were 84 men, 44 women, and 18 children killed on the field, while at least seven Lakota were mortally wounded. Many soldiers looted the dead and took souvenirs, such as ghost dance shirts. Many were later sold as trophies. According to the report filed by General Nelson A. Miles, a scuffle occurred between one deaf warrior who had a rifle in his hand and two soldiers. The rifle was discharged and a battle occurred. Not only the warriors, but the sick Chief Spotted Elk and a number of women and children who tried to escape by running or scattering over the prairie were hunted down and killed. 
The fallout from the event was expected almost immediately due to the bad press that the army expected to receive, so the government went into full damage control. An investigation was launched soon afterward, and eyewitness accounts confirmed that Black Coyote's rifle fired when he was seized from behind by the soldiers. Statements were gathered from survivors on both sides. One of Bigfoot's warriors who survived, Wazumaza, supported the fact that Black Coyote was deaf, and he stated, if they had left him alone, he was going to put his gun down where he should. They grabbed him and spinned him in the east direction. He was still unconcerned even then. He hadn't his gun pointed at anyone. His intention was to put that gun down. They came on and grabbed the gun that he was going to put down. Right after they spun him around, there was the report of the gun. It was quite loud. I couldn't say that anyone was shot, but following that was a crash. Wazumaza ironically later changed his name to Dewey Beard. Another witness, Trooper Theodore Ragnar of the 7th Cavalry, also stated that Black Coyote was deaf. In contrast, another statement by another survivor named Turning Hawk called Black Coyote a crazy man, a young man of very bad influence and, in fact, a nobody. Many historians believe that the soldiers of the 7th Cavalry were intent upon taking revenge for the regiment's defeat at Little Bighorn in July 1876 and the death of George Armstrong Custer. That may be true, but there is no confirmed evidence. Another voice was heard from, former Pine Ridge Indian agent Valentine T. McGillicuddy, who was asked by General Leonard Wright Colby, commander of the Nebraska National Guard, to provide his opinion of the Army response to the ghost dance movement. Following is an excerpt from his letter dated January 15, 1891. As for the ghost dance, too much attention has been paid to it. It was only the symptom or surface indication of a deep-rooted, long-existing difficulty, as well as treat the eruption of smallpox as the disease and ignore the constitutional disease. As regards disarming the Sioux, however desirable it may appear, I consider it neither advisable nor practicable. I fear it will result as the theoretical enforcement of prohibition in Kansas, Iowa, and Dakota. You will succeed in disarming and keeping disarmed the friendly Indians because you can, and you will not succeed with the mob element because you cannot. If I were again to be an Indian agent and had my choice, I would take charge of 10,000 armed Sioux in preference to a like number of disarmed ones, and furthermore, agree to handle that number or the whole Sioux nation without a white soldier. Respectfully, etc., V.T. McGillicuddy. Colonel James Forsyth was held personally responsible and removed from command by General Miles, who was disgusted that Forsyth had approved of the brutal killings of innocent women and children. This was especially true when it was proven that many of the Lakota were unarmed. Forsyth, in performing personal damage control to save his career, rewrote his after-action report, praising his troops for their courage in the face of religious fanaticism. The Army held a court of inquiry, but not a court-martial, which was convened by General Miles with a board of general officers, which criticized Forsyth for his tactical dispositions but otherwise exonerated him of responsibility. Forsyth was later reinstated and became a major general, and Miles opposed his promotions along the way, convinced he was a murderer. The government added insult to injury when it awarded 19 soldiers the Medal of Honor specifically for a wounded knee, and 31 others also awarded the Medal of Honor for the entire campaign based upon Forsyth's report. Today, the site of the massacre has the Wounded Knee National Historic Landmark and is designated a National Historic Landmark by the U.S. Department of the Interior. In 1990, both houses of the U.S. Congress passed a resolution on the historical centennial formally expressing deep regret for the massacre. Their response from the press was not long in coming, and some were not very bothered by the event. The Aberdeen Saturday Pioneer editor, L. Frank Baum, later the author of The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, wrote in his editorial on January 3, 1891, 
The pioneer has before declared that our only safety depends upon the total extermination of the Indians. Having wronged them for centuries, we had better, in order to protect our civilization, follow it up with one more wrong and wipe these untamed and untamable creatures from the face of the earth. In this lies future safety for our settlers and the soldiers who are under incompetent commands. Otherwise, we may expect future years to be as full of trouble with the Redskins as those have been in the past. Despite the original intentions, the Wounded Knee Massacre ended the Ghost Dance movement and was one of the last major confrontations in the Indian Wars. The greatest prizes were the ghost shirts, and in 1891, one shirt with bullet holes and bloodstains was brought to Glasgow, Scotland, with Buffalo Bill Cody's Wild West Traveling Show. A year later, it was given to Kelvin Grove Museum by George C. Crager, a member of the show, and the shirt was on public display from 1892 until 1999. Of interest, your humble narrator was also a part of the story. I was living in Glasgow at the time, attending graduate school, and I was invited to join the committee by Scottish First Secretary Donald Dewar, whom I had only met recently, as he and the city council met with Marcella LeBeau, secretary of the Wounded Knee Association and great-granddaughter of one of the survivors of Wounded Knee in November 1998. I was asked by Dewar, Well, what do you think about their wanting to have the shirt back, Colin? I responded, Sir, if another country had the tunic of Robert the Bruce, would you not want it back? He looked at me, smiled, nodded his head, and said, I understand. Thank you. The Lakota Nation wanted the shirt, a deeply important piece of their culture and history returned to the Lakota people. And after being given a handmade replica made by Marcella LeBeau herself, I was there when the Glasgow City Council voted to return the original shirt if the city residents supported the move in a special vote. After LeBeau and the other Lakota tribal representatives made their case, and then the committee went into deliberation, I spoke with Marcella LeBeau and learned more from her about the shirt and its significance, which I did not know much about before. Marcella said, This will bring about a sense of closure to a sad and horrible event. Now healing can begin. The committee came back and said they would put it to the people of Glasgow to make that decision. Having lived in Glasgow for almost four years, I was very impressed with the response from the public. The people agreed. They decided that the shirt should go home. After the repatriation ceremonies, the shirt was stored at the Museum of the South Dakota State Historical Society. A celebration was held at Eagle Butte on August 1, 2009 to commemorate the 10th anniversary of the return of this ghost dance shirt. In 2018, Marcella LeBeau expressed her desire for the shirt to be moved to the cultural center of the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe at Eagle Butte. Thanks for watching today's episode of Forgotten History. If you like this episode, please consider becoming a channel member or joining our Patreon page. This would help us offset the ever-increasing cost of production. As always, please like, share, and comment. And if you have any show ideas, please contact us, and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Until next time.